Well, it's a pleasure being here, and uh, I come from Puerto Rico, and I thank uh, Ron Hunningig and also Thomas Libby because they've given us tremendous support to help the movement in the island of Puerto Rico, and support to me and to the physicians there. So, and of course, they love coming to Puerto Rico. Who wouldn't, right? <laughs> so uh, they've come twice already, and uh, that's wonderful. Keep coming down. That's a wonderful island, and we welcome you. And. Uh, I will be talking today about uh, something that I never imagined I would be doing in my practice. I'm, uh, until what time do I have? 10.15? Uh, OK. Thank you. Uh, as a radiation oncologist, I never imagined that I would be uh, doing what I'm doing today, because I was taught to give radiation, chemotherapy, and surgery to treat cancers. Then I started hearing about chelation therapy, ozone, 25 years ago, and the concept that toxicity was causing cancer. And, I, and I'm making the link now between that and treating viruses with vitamin C. And uh, removing these toxins in the 90s showed in many of my patients that the tumors would reduce or disappear. So I didn't expect this. I did a protocol at that time back in the late 90s with intravenous vitamin C, chelation therapy, ozone therapy, detoxification, uh, organic uh, food, all these things that I heard that would make a difference to see if I would embark in, into this uh, new era of philosophy. And, uh, and of course, the most important thing is to uh, get rid of your stress. Sometimes we'll be throwing a spouse out the window, but not, not as <laughs> radical, but you know what I mean. And uh, sometimes we'll be getting rid of a job. And what we found in 40 patients in the 90s with stage four, most of them cancer, was that we had an 80% response rate doing this protocol every day. Every day is not practical. Sometimes it's not economical. It's, it can be expensive. But that's what we saw. And 13% went in a complete remission. So that we didn't expect either. And today, one of those patients that we still follow has been almost 20 years with no lymphoma. <coughs> he had a stage four lymphoma and AIDS at the same time. As you know, stage four lymphoma and AIDS has a very poor prognosis. At that time in the 90s, none of these patients survived. So the patient is alive and well, and it's because of all of these things that we're seeing here. What I wasn't expecting was that not only did cancer respond, but I saw patients over the years that uh, with the same protocol started reversing their arthritis, high blood pressure, diabetes, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, cataracts, glaucoma, and the list goes on and on. And that's uh, when I started seeing the connection between the viral illnesses and content of vitamin C. I'm not so sure that vitamin C is an antiviral per se. I think that just that bombardment of electrons that we've been hearing about all through the weekend and the week makes the body get into a balance where we start living together with all these uh, microbes and viruses and nobody harms anybody, but rather assists each other into having a better environment, being healthier, et cetera, digesting our food and things that can help us instead of killing us. Because when the energy goes down in the body, that's the signal for these microbes to recycle us for compost. We're, <laughs> we're also needed for that. And when somebody asks me, what's the most important animal in the planet? I say, of course, it's a tree. I say, are you crazy? Yeah, the tree is so advanced, they don't have to move. We, we have to move and talk, and we can't stop. But we're moving around so we can compost different trees. We can carry the compost to them. They don't have to move. So that's the most advanced animal in the planet. And of course, the planet can live without us, but not without the trees. They have to produce oxygen, and, and they're the ones that recycle all this. So when our energy goes down and it goes back up, that's when we see all these uh, wonderful things that we're seeing in medicine. Uh, right now, I want to mention, too, that I'm a professor at the UCC School of Medicine. They recently approved 
in the beginning of the summer, an integrated medicine program that is approved by the School of Medicine. So now, actually the applause goes to you because many of you have been helping and assisting in this process and the students are, th uh, fourth year medical students are coming from other institutions and now we're just a step away from first and second year residents. There's one from Harvard that contacted me and thank God that Harvard apparently pays for the resident salary. So we don't have to worry about that. So if you have any ideas of interns and residents that wanna rotate uh, with me, you let me know because this is what we're doing. Uh, unfortunately, doctors that are as young as, <coughs> as young as me or a little bit older are in general very hard to change in their mindset. So we're getting them as young as we can. Also, the <coughs> this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the lecture, but in general, I, I uh, encourage my fellow colleagues to speak in a certain language that they don't get into trouble because I gotten into trouble before. I used to... Uh, I found that nebulized colloidal silver can eliminate respiratory infections, pneumonias, sinusitis, and other things. And uh, that was uh, something I put in my website, that I recommend the colloidal silver as a preventive measure for anthrax. If you remember anthrax in the 90s, the big scare. So uh, when I said that that could be used for that, I got a letter from the FDA two weeks later they say you cannot say that you're, you recommend silver to prevent disease because then it will be a drug and then you'll get into all this mess. And I said, oh, no problem. So what I did, I, they encouraged me to delete the, the page. So I didn't delete it. What I do, did was I recommend you use colloidal silver because it may or may not prevent lung infections and that was it. I never heard from them again. So. Be careful when you say cure. If you don't say I cure, I prevent, I treat, or mitigate, you're not under your, uh, FDA jurisdiction. Just uh, so you're aware of that. Also, <clears throat> the, uh, I don't know if you heard of the President's Cancer Panel Report. This is one of the best things that Obama has done or has been allowed to do, is a, is a more accurate statement. Uh, the, he, when he was uh, elected president, one of the first things he did, he's not here, is he told the uh, National Cancer Institute, the National Institutes of Health, and the Department of Health and Human Services, write me a report, I don't care how much money it costs, that says what is the cost of cancer in the United States. And by, in less than one year, there was a report signed by these three institutions that said, Mr. President, what causes cancer in the US, they didn't say 80%, 90%, they, say more, they said more than two thirds and perhaps even more are caused by pollution of the air, pollution of the water and pollution of the food and x-ray machines in hospitals. They never mentioned genetics except to say that uh, genetically transmitted cancer like ataxia, telangiectasia, seroderma, pigmentosa, you know these conditions, multiple endocrine neoplasia, accounted for less than 5% of the cancer. So now the institutions are online with what we're saying here, that these pollutants are causing disease, not only cancer, but everything else that we're seeing, either the cause or a contributing factor. So focusing on removing them, not only from our bodies, but from our environment, that's my dream, to have a completely clean planet. That's what I think about 24 hours a day. That's why I'm not invited to many parties, because <laughs> especially doctors' parties. So as we know, Frederick Klenner has been a pioneer of vitamin C from the 20s, 30s. He was treating, managing, since, the, since I'm not treating, I'm not the FDA, I can say he was treating, he was curing. So that's another important distinction. He, uh, he was one of the first doctors to realize that vitamin C could manage viral diseases uh, successfully. And he was able to cure many different infectious diseases and neutralize toxins. By the way, I'm giving credit to Thomas Levy because thanks to him, I got a lot of the references I'm presenting today. He did, the, he did most of the work. So I have to thank you. 
He came to Puerto Rico three years ago to our integrated medicine conference sponsored by the College of Physicians. 250 physicians came. He lectured on the use of vitamin C for viral diseases. So a lot of these uh, references and the work we've done together was inspired by that lecture. Uh, vitamin C has been proven to kill or inactivate all viruses in vitro. So this is the, first of all, we're gonna talk about the in vitro findings. And uh, examples are poliovirus by jogging blood, completely inactivated the poliovirus, rendering, complete, rendering it completely non-infectious, even when injected directly into the brains of monkeys. This is very interesting. Herpes virus. The in vitro action of synthetic crystalline vitamin C or on herpes virus and Further experiments have shown these on herpes. Also, in vitro activity when tested against vaccinia viruses, tobacco mo mosaic virus, and in vitro activity against bacteriophage viruses, enteroviruses, and influenza virus, which we're gonna talk about in the clinical setting in a little while, as well as rabies. So this has been shown to happen in vitro. When we go into the clinical setting, it has uh, also been shown to resolve a lot of acute viral illnesses such as polio. Klenner showed that of 60 kids that he had, and he published this data in 1949, he cured all these kids with intramuscular vitamin C given within four days, including a case of meningoencephalitis flaccid paralysis, reversal of this. So, Today, I haven't seen any of these cases, but Guillain-Barre will be very interesting to manage. And I think that a lot of the Guillain-Barre's that we're told are out there are really poliovirus or polio-like viruses. So we're changing the nomenclature of polio, meningoencephalitis, flaccid paralysis, and now we're calling it Guillain-Barre. I think it's the same entity, so we have to be very careful. And all viruses have the potential to cause the same thing that poliovirus did. So we think that only polio can cause <clears throat> neuropathy or neural damage, not so. Any other virus can, can cause this. So be very aware of that because that's another opportunity to use vitamin C. And of course, uh, the reversal of flaccid paralysis and uh, Klenner's experience with polio, he gave this patients uh, orally as well as intramuscularly, various levels of vitamin C that we've seen here from 50 to 50,000 to 80,000 milligrams given at various times over a 10-day period. So I encourage you to read these papers because Klenner papers are relevant today. If you read them, they're the best uh, scientific uh, treatise that you can see from a scientist. It's amazing how he writes clearly, scientifically, so it's, it's not messing around with him. And these papers, some of them are 80 years old, and they're an incredible... Uh, an incredible read, so I recommend them, any of them. In another clinical setting, vitamin C has been shown to be effective against acute hepatitis. Dalton gave uh, daily injections of vitamin C and had a resolution of acute hepatitis as well as Cathcart. So these are the different doses that you might see. Again, I, I'm not getting very much into the doses here, but because we've seen the dosages throughout this conference, dosage, dosages can vary, but they're usually the same that we've seen here from 20,000 milligrams to uh, uh, 60,000 milligrams. And I'll show you how many times for, how, for the different viruses that we may see and frequency and all that I will be discussing in a while. But I wanted to show you the references that show that this has already been performed for many decades. In addition, vitamin C has been shown to uh, manage successfully viral encephalitis. Klenner has seen this with patients that have polio and uh, in my practice, we saw a patient with influenza with meningoencephalitis that was close to a coma, was stuporous, non-responsive, not oriented, a very young gal, 28 years old, that resolved after one infusion, one six-hour infusion of vitamin C, gave her a total of 50,000 milligrams. I added hydrogen peroxide, and I'll explain that to you as well. 
and hydration. And this completely resolved the same day that she presented to our clinic. Other examples of acute viral infections that respond to vitamin C are measles, simple and complicated, mumps, simple and complicated, herpes infection, influenza, and rabies. And of course, it's also just to mention that it's also been shown to be effective against bacteria. So this could be a lecture for, for a future presentation, but it has been shown to be effective for diphtheria, tetanus, staphylococcus, streptococcus, pseudomonas, and all have been documented as cured in these papers that have been uh, talking about these entities with ascorbic acid. And of course, vitamin C, I'm not sure what the mechanism is, but it is often bactericidal, almost always bacteriostatic, and always supportive of the immune system. And of course, in patients with chronically low levels of vitamin C, this definitely will help other systems fight the infection. And other diseases such as malaria, leprosy, dysentery, trypanosoma. So the point is that <clears throat> It's very advisable to have vitamin C handy in the clinic, especially when you're seeing infections that are either acute, chronic, either in adults or children, because they can, uh, th this can enhance whatever other therapeutic approach you're taking in that patient. And of course, the list goes on and on, and we've been hearing about it, as vitamin C as an antidote. So a lot of what these infections produce are also part of the toxicity on the body, such as toxins, and these can be neutralized, such as uh, heavy metals, uh, venoms from not only animals, but also plants, alcohol, and barbiturates. In Puerto Rico, we have a lot of nettle leaf. It's called in Spanish ortiga, for the Puerto Ricans that are in the room. And nettle leaf, uh, I personally had a, I, I go a lot into the rainforest for leisure. And uh, I didn't know what nettle leaf was until one time it, it, I touched one of these plants and immediately you feel severe pain and burning. In a scale from zero to 10, the pain is close to eight. So it's, it's very, very uncomfortable. And after this happening to me several times, I used vitamin C one time and it, it, within an hour or two, the pain went away and the inflammation subsided. So whenever you, uh, have, if you have a first aid kit, add, I would add vitamin C to it, either in the office or at your home. And of course, what I mentioned about the clearing of polio in 60 children within four days of administration by Dr. Klenner, it's just repeating that. So to recap, the, it has been shown to have an effect against influenza, dengue fever, hepatitis A, B, and C, Epstein-Barr, measles, mumps, uh, herpes, and uh, these are the doses that we recommend to our patients in general. An adult, and this is very interesting dosing because we found that if we're not able to give intravenous vitamin C, I tell my patients to take vitamin C every half hour by mouth. So it used to be every hour, now we tend to tell them immediately after an infection, such as, let me give you a few examples. Not only the common cold, influenza that have been documented, but also sore throat, sniffles, cough, and a very commonly seen in polluted cities, uh, cities uh, chronic sinusitis. Chronic sinusitis has become an epidemic. So in Puerto Rico, I tell the patients take uh, 500 to 1,000 milligrams every half hour for the first four hours. Then I tell them if they don't have any uh, discomfort, and usually they don't, a, a vitamin C such as Live On or Bioenergy, which we've seen in Riordan Center yesterday, they're excellent, and usually they will not cause stomach problems. I give my patients routinely uh, of the Bioenergy C 4,000 milligrams three times a day or more and they usually have no problems whatsoever versus taking a vitamin C from the pharmacy, which might be also considered high quality. So 
I tell them to do this every half hour. Usually within four hours, 50% of the symptoms have subsided about 50%. And in some of them have disappeared, especially with a chronic sinusitis, a cough that is starting, a sore throat that is starting. Once a fever starts, I recommend intravenous vitamin C. That symptom may not respond as well as the initial, very initial uh, respiratory symptoms of the diseases related to the influenza and cold viruses. So then I tell the patient to take one gram every two to three hours, uh, sometimes uh, for, for two hours, and then I, I lower the dose. But in general, as a baseline, 4,000 milligrams three times a day, taken in three doses will not help the patient with cold symptoms the way that the every half hour dosing will. So remember that. When there's an acute illness, frequency is more important than total dosage. Keeping those levels of vitamin C in the blood for as long as possible and as frequent as possible. For children, two years or older, 200 milligrams every half hour to every hour for four hours, again, for respiratory, acute respiratory symptomatology. And then you can lower that clinically as you see fit. Children that are six years or older, 500 milligrams every half hour to every hour for the first four hours. And then you can lower it as you see fit, as you see a clinical response. And these I found to be extremely effective if the patient, and it's usually a patient that calls me and they're not able to come into the clinic. So sometimes they don't, they may not have the, the vitamin C I would recommend, even though most of my patients do. So if they have to have, if they have to go to the pharmacy to buy a vitamin C or a chewable, that's better than nothing and that'll work fine for that period of time of the acute illness in most cases. We also, <clears throat> we also give our patients that have uh, not only cancer patients that get vitamin C, but also patients that have viral illnesses, we give hydrogen peroxide before the vitamin C to enhance the effect of vitamin C, which is hydrogen peroxide produ production related. And I looked into the literature since intravenous hydrogen peroxide had be has been so popular in integrated medicine. I look to see where in the literature there was evidence about this. I only found one reference. It was from 1920. And Oliver treated patients with influenza that had uh, influenza-related pneumonia, which was considered at the time to have a mortality of 80%. And he gave these patients a 1.25% solution of hydrogen peroxide, two ounces, 10% added to eight ounces of normal saline. That's uh, a much more than we give today. Today we, give, we use a 3%, not a, a 3% solution of hydrogen peroxide, and we take three cc's of that and put it in 100 cc's of normal saline. So it's much more diluted than this. And uh, he had a reduction in mortality in those patients from a historical 80% to 48%. So he reduced mortality from influenza-related pneumonia by half. And this is the only paper that we found at the time, because we have another paper that we'll present next about the treatment of chikungunya using hydrogen peroxide as well. Influenza, unfortunately, the, the vaccine campaign has been a disaster in Puerto Rico and the United States. You can go to the website of CDC and the data is there. In Puerto Rico in 2009, when the swine flu appeared, we didn't have a vaccine. So the only strategy that the Department of Health had was a, a, an incredible campaign. It was a great campaign of washing your hands, covering your mouth with a mask. If you were coughing, getting away from people, or you would have to get away from people that were coughing. And uh, this strategy reduced the incidence, prevalence, and mortality of influenza to near zero. The strategy was started in the summer of 2009. Then the vaccine came in in October from the National Institutes of Health. 
And the last figures from November in Puerto Rico, it, it was amazing. The, the incidence of influenza went to near zero, the mortality to near zero. And the total number of cases at the time was less than 2,000. Since then, we've had massive vaccination campaigns over 65 years old, all ages. Influenza vaccine is still uh, sold as the best strategy against influ uh, influenza by the Department of Health and also by the CDC, unfortunately. And then, unfortunately, the, the figures are there. The influenza incidence and mortality has been rising steadily in Puerto Rico since 2009, since the vaccine was introduced. Immediately after, after introduction in October, in November, the, uh, the incidences went up. The campaign for washing, using gels, avoiding people that were coughing, ceased. And then uh, the last figures of this past season that ended uh, just before the summer, we have about 30, thousand cases of influenza a year in Puerto Rico. So from 2000, we went to close to 30,000. Also, the mortality has gone up. So it's been a total failure, but they still recommend it. Recently, the dengue vaccine was offered to the Puerto Rican State Department and the State Department's, the Department of Health said, well, we don't want the vaccine because it only provides protection in 50% of the patients. But that's exactly the, the, the highest amount of protection that the influenza vaccine offers in its best case scenario, because in adults more than 65 years of age is totally worthless. In children, they've been able, they've been seeing a lowering of the response, antibody response to the influenza vaccine. And this data is in the CDC. I mean, you can open the CDC and we'll find a lot of this there. They found that in children, the vaccine response has been going down, as it's been as low as 15% uh, for the influenza vaccine. So what they did is they quadrupled the antigenic load of the vaccine in the last few years. Instead of saying, wait a minute, I wonder why uh, the immune response of the children is lower than before, which by the way, is a contraindication to vaccination. Immunosuppression is a contraindication to vaccination, not upping the dose of antigen, but rather finding out why is this child immunosuppressed? Well, we all know why. We have more pollution than ever before in the history of humanity and other things that are affecting our system's ability to produce antibodies and other things. So my patients asked me, and I said, the, the data is there. I'd rather have you protected with things like this than do vaccination, but <clears throat> If you want to do vaccination, go prepared. Take vitamin C before getting vaccinated so you lower your chances of any side effects if you want to get vaccinated. I don't tell them what to do, but I said if you want to get your child vaccinated, also prepare them properly with vitamin C before that vaccination. And it's, uh, in all likelihood, they won't have uh, the side effects that we are seeing from this uh, from this. Uh, modality in medicine. So unfortunately, Tamiflu uh, is a joke, unfortunately. And I'm a scientist, but I'm giving you the, the short story. Tamiflu has been reported to lower the length of disease by 24 hours. So instead of being sick for three days, you'll be sick for two days. Instead of being sick for five days that you were meant to be, you're sick for four. This is the average, and these are the statistics. However, when you go to Tamiflu's website, in the first page, and by the way, this happens also in the first page of the websites for uh, uh, Ariset and Namenda, which are the medicines for Alzheimer's and the Exelon patches. The same thing in the four websites first page. This drug does not affect the natural history or course of the disease, but that's exactly why I want to prescribe it, to affect the natural course of the disease. So if he's, if he's not affecting the natural course of the disease, why are you recommending it to my patients? It's a joke. You, you, can, you can only laugh at these things. 
Now, recently, they've been removing from the Namenda, Ariset, and Exxon uh, websites that little clause. But that clause, I saw it as, uh, as late as uh, two years ago. Recently, I tried to find it again to put it up uh, for this presentation, and I didn't find it. But they've been putting that for years. These drugs do not affect the natural cause of the disease. That's how statistics can be massaged you know, in many of the studies to then recommend them to patients, but they really have no, no clinical use for us or them. But something that we will all agree on is that when you ask the CDC or Department of Health, what is the treatment of any viral disease? They say there's no treatment for viral diseases, which is preposterous. I mean, this data that we've been seeing, even if it's historical, even if it's not hysterical, historical, even if it's something that has not been proven in a randomized double-blind study, it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is that when there is no treatment available and you have something that historically has shown these results, you're morally and ethically obligated as a physician or an entity that is uh, dealing with healthcare to recommend this to the patients, especially when there's no side effects, it's cost-effective, and safe and effective and low cost, like Dr. Saul was saying yesterday. No effective treatment for viral illnesses or meningitis or meningoencephalitis associated with influenza. In Puerto Rico, we've managed about 57 patients where we looked at the charts with influenza that were managed with intravenous vitamin C and hydrogen peroxide from 2009 to 2015. They had the clinical diagnosis, most of them, because you remember 15, 10, 20 years ago, influenza was not a big deal. It has become a big deal because of the immunosuppression in the population and the complications associated with it. This did not used to happen the way it's happening today. So now uh, we're starting to confirm the cases uh, by blood test. There were only two cases confirmed in this group of patients. 60% had leukopenia. Most of them had congestion and cough. Ascorbic acid was given intravenously, usually a 500 cc bag of sterile water or lactated ringer solution, 20,000 to 25,000 milligrams. Now, <clears throat> influenza is one of the viruses that respond the best to intravenous vitamin C. Not so with others like chikungunya or herpes, and we'll, we'll see that. And uh, we also added to this mix thiamine, pyridoxine B complex, one cc each, and hydrogen peroxide, three cc of a 3% solution in 100 cc normal saline, methylcobalamin, magnesium chloride was often introduced as well. The results in these patients that had IVs that range from two to four hours of infusion time, 100% of the patients had a decrease of 50% or more of their symptoms by the end of the infusion. A 28-year-old female with suspected meningoencephalitis was obtunded and disoriented to time space after one week of a viral illness consisting of fevers, chills, malaise, cough, and headaches, had 50,000 milligrams vitamin C intravenously. By the end of the infusion, was completely oriented and feeling well with no headaches, malaise, and eating well. Have you heard of chikungunya? How many of you have a lot of chikungunya in your cities or states? Not many people. It's you too? Okay, Ecuador. All right. I never forget that epidemic in Puerto Rico. Every healthcare facility, private, public, was overwhelmed over that summer, which was uh, two years ago. And uh, I never seen anything like it. We had to write records in three or four sentences to keep up with the people coming in. And this happened in the emergency rooms for. For that summer, I mean, uh, all physicians were overwhelmed regardless of facilities uh, or specialties because uh, we have been doing vitamin C. We were particularly overwhelmed. But anyways, uh, at the time that this was uh, written, it was a disease where one million cases suspected in North America, South America, and the Caribbean, less cases that were confirmed. And uh, in Puerto Rico, at the time, that I wrote this in July 2014, there were 24,000 suspected cases, but if you multiply that by, that by 10, because you only diagnose about a tenth of what's really out there, 
There were a quarter of a million cases at the time. And this, we calculated, it may have gone up to 750,000 cases in that summer. Now, it was a very rare instance because most of these patients, you would do the blood work, and it was completely normal. There was no leukopenia. The, the only thing that you would see frequently will be a neutral cytosis. Uh, so the leukocytosis will be in the neutrophilic area instead of lymphocytic. So it didn't make much sense. And this was, was seen across the board. The blood work was no help. It wasn't like a typical viral illness. But chikungunya means that which bends over. And it's quite a scary situation in many ways. Number one, you would expect a viral illnesses to uh, hit an elderly or very young population more than the public in general, the, the so-called considered healthy adults. Not so. This would affect everybody equally, including I saw a lot of marathon runners, high performance athletes, very, very sick. And number two, it makes you feel the way you're gonna feel in 20 or 30 years, in terms of your joints, if you're not taking care of yourself. So it's a, it's a snapshot into the future, and it was scary to most people. Imagine, okay, you're moving now, everything's fine. Imagine how you would feel in 34 years and the worst of your times, you know, before we die, and that's the way that these people felt. Sudden pain, and most people could not walk typically, started in the wrists, ankles, and then it will go to any other part of the body, but wrists and ankles was very common. But was so painful in the wrists and ankles that most people could not walk, and most people could not pick up things with their hands. So it was very interesting, tremendously excruciating pain. Some of these patients will come to us after six to eight months of disease, where the disease will wax and wane with steroids, but it will not go away. And typically, these, uh, this disease can last in up to 35 to 40% of the patients for years. So again, we have proof here that a lot of these uh, so-called arthritic illnesses, rheumatoid fever is being documented that is associated with a microorganism, but I believe that all arthritis are associated to microorganisms, all of them. And they're managed in our clinic in the same way. So chikungunya means that which bends up, genus of the alpha virus, a single-stranded RNA, the family Togaviridae, spread by the Aedes aegypti mosquito, who is not at fault for this. They say the mosquito causes the illness. The mosquito doesn't cause anything. The, poor mo the mosquito is trying to keep the population down so we stop polluting. But, <laughs> So he's trying to, but if I tell that, you, know, you see, that's why I'm not invited to parties, I told you. <laughs> this kind of comment. Also spreads the dengue hemorrhagic fever, thrombocytopenia, and now the Zika virus, which we'll talk about it as well. Southern onset of joint pains in 93% of the patients, rash and fevers, last from a few days to weeks. And that 33% has gone up to 48%, where the arthritis can persist in, in these patients for up to four months to five years. I didn't put the reference here, but uh, Thomas Levy and I co-authored a paper that uh, the American Medical Association uh, Journal in Puerto Rico published last year, it's in PubMed, so if you go to PubMed and look for ascorbic acid and chikungunya, you'll see the whole paper. I'll be happy to send it to you, I have it in PDF. So Thomas, thank you for your help, of course. We treated 56 patients from July to November 2014 with chikungunya, 18 to 82 years old. Ratio of females to males was three to one, so more females than males. 75% of the patients received between 25 and 30 grams of intravenous ascorbic acid. And 100% 100, 100 of them received before the ascorbic acid, hydrogen peroxide intravenously. And seven, six, five, and three patients respectively receive 30 grams, 20 grams, 50 grams, and 40. The formula was the following, 100 cc normal saline, 3 cc of a 3% hydrogen peroxide solution, and 1,000 micrograms of methylcobalamin, and 500 milligrams of magnesium chloride. 
500 cc store of water or lactated ringers, 2550 grams of ascorbic acid, B complex, um, B1 and B6, 1 cc each. Uh, I'm sorry, we have the formula there 100 milligrams, 2 milligrams riboflavin, 100 milligrams thiamine, which is uh, uh, B1, and 100 milligrams pyridoxin, B6. Infuse over two to four hours, including the the hydrogen peroxide, of course. Patients must eat before and during the IV because of the hypoglycemic episode that we've seen. By the way, I practiced in Florida for about 15, 17 years. I had infusion centers uh, there, and we would give the same doses. I never encounter hypoglycemia. Why is that? Well, I think that Americans eat more than Puerto Ricans, <laughs> and that's the obesity rate. We're eating all the time in the United States. In Puerto Rico, I started seeing hypoglycemia. That's the first time I saw it. And it's because when, I, when we ask people, did you have breakfast today before they eat? Yeah, I had breakfast. OK. So when we asked them what breakfast was, why well, I had a coffee and a little juice. No, that's not breakfast. So uh, historically and culturally, we're not used to having those big breakfasts. So now we make patients sign a form. I mean, this is how problematic it was. The hypoglycemia caused a lot of problems in our clinic uh, when he started. We have patients sign, saying what they ate, and bringing snacks during the IV. They have to bring snacks. So that's a, pr that's a problem we have in Puerto Rico, but we don't have it anymore. We don't infuse if the blood pressure is above 150 over 95. We examine pain relief as the variable that then we assessed and evaluated. So we use a numeric rating scale from zero to 10. Zero, no pain. 10, the worst pain you've had in your life. And we score the pain as follows. We took all the sites and we did an average of all the sites and that was the pain score. So we did a pain score which was average of all the sites that hurt before and after the infusion. That's how fast this can work. We use a SPSS IBM 22 statistics package to see the relationship between the treatment and the pain score. And that was plotted in a histogram and frequency tables I, I'll show you. And we compare the parameters and use a p-value of 0 0.001 to determine significance. Instead of 0 0.05, we opted to 0 0.001. That was uh, the parameter. Of the 56 patients at the 25 percentile of pain score, lesser pain intensity, pre-treatment score of seven at the average, and post-treatment score was two. So it went down from seven to two on the average on those lesser pain intensity patients for a 71% reduction of pain. Patients at the 75 percentile of pain score, which are the ones that had the worst pain, had a reduction of a score from eight to four, 60% reduction of pain. There was complete disappearance of pain on 9% of the patients and no response in five. And the p-value for this was less than 0 0.001, but I wanna show you the tables because they demonstrate this in, a, in an easier format for our eyes to catch. The pain score is in the lower horizontal bar and how many patients in the vertical, the frequency. And as you can see, most patients had from six to 10. Most patients had six to 10 intensity, all this group. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an excruciating pain in most of these patients. This is before treatment, and this is immediately after treatment. So, uh, but we saw that it wasn't like influenza where in most of the patients, just one treatment would be enough. We've seen that, and this was not part of this paper, with in chikungunya patients, we need to give them three infusions of vitamin C, day one, two, and three. And that will eradicate practically 90 or more percent of the pain in all patients permanently. But it's a very tough virus, virus compared to the influenza. There were no reported side effects, none, zero. So if you take the precautions of eating before and after treatment, no side effects. Of course, sometimes you may have a vasovagal reaction, um, 
You may have also pain on the infusion side, extravasation, but in this particular group, there were no side effects. And as, as I told you, patients had a recurrence of pain and a second and third infusion was needed uh, at the time. Another important point, the most commonly prescribed steroid for these patients was solumedrol or prednisone. I think that's, a, that's shooting a cockroach with a tank. So, which can kill it, but it's quite, it's not good. I learned that Cortef, five milligrams, not only can help most of these patients, that's hydrocortisone, but it will not alter the pituitary uh, adrenal axis. So you can stop this in one day. It doesn't have the danger of the uh, suppression of the pituitary adrenal axis. And it doesn't have the side effects of high dose steroids. So Cortef, five milligrams, we use with the patients. And we definitely prefer that to the other steroids. So if you're gonna use steroids, this is the one I recommend. So from, from that time, we treated 102 patients. And uh, the ultimate control with those three infusions is usually around 90% and they have to eat before or during treatment. And no air travel for 24 hours after the infusion. Why is that? Because hydrogen peroxide may produce small bubbles, and that's not a problem clinically. We don't have side effects. But if you get in a plane and there are still bubbles there, the exactly the same thing that happens to a diver when they come up too quickly can happen. You can form bubbles. We never seen that, but we tell our patients not to travel 24 hours after that infusion, or 24 hours after direct intravenous ozone infusion. So that's a rule in our clinic. We treated six patients with chikungunya with intravenous ozone because we, we uh, like Thomas Levy here, had the impression that ozone will work for that. It has worked before for other viral illnesses and problems. Now, over the years, I, I, I've done ozone, and we used to give more doses and get into some problems that we don't get into right now. I, I want to clarify that the Madrid Declaration does not endorse direct intravenous infusion because of the problems that may be associated with it. And I perfectly understand that. I perfectly understand that consensus writing. And in a way, I agree with them the way I used to be 15, 20 years ago. But if this is done carefully, for example, but what I call carefully is that we don't use more than 20 gamma. That's the concentration of the ozone with the oxygen ozone mixture that comes out of the machine. If we have a higher concentration, then we start getting sclerosing of the veins, number one. We don't want to get sclerosing of veins in anyone. So once you get one of those side effects, you want to avoid it, and that's why I was leaning towards using all the ways of administering ozone that are gentler in the body, and I definitely agree with gentle. So now we're using 20 gamma or less. We have never since then gotten any sclerosing of the veins. Number two, giving too much direct intravenous infusion of ozone or too rapidly could cause a temporary embolus that will cause a tremendous cough that can last an hour or two. Very uncomfortable, chest pains, because they lodge in the pulmonary artery branch system. And that's another thing that we don't like to see. And number three, it also will cause that hypoglycemia to the point in some patients that it could cause a complete uh, blindness, which is temporary, but is very scary when it happens. And it's totally reversible. Those are things you, you want to avoid. And direct intravenous uh, ozone, if it's not done properly, and by properly, I mean 20 gamma, number one. Number two, we never start the way we used to when I started more than 20 years ago during doing ozone with 30 to 60 cc's of ozone. That's what we used to do. Never again. I start patients with five cc's. Then the following week, I give them 10. The following week, 15. And if I keep doing that, I will never see a problem anymore. I don't see a problem anymore. So we go slow, low concentration, eat before you come to the clinic. Very important issues and matters. Now, over five to 10 minutes. Now the body will get used to it, but if a patient does not come for two or three weeks, we start the process again. 
So if they were at 20 and they come a month later, we don't do 25 a month later because then we may get into trouble again. The body will get disused to the ozone. It was used to it and the mechanisms for clearing and accepting it were fine. So we start again at five or 10. So if we follow those guidelines, direct intravenous ozone is, is safe, effective, and uh, uh, cost effective as well. And we will have no side effects. So we start with a five, 10, 15. There was, and we did those three, three days in a row, in all patients, these six patients with chikungunya, they had complete resolution of pain within three days in all six patients. And one patient had minimal chest discomfort that cleared in one hour. It wasn't the usual cough or the usual chest pain, just a discomfort. But we have to study this more. It's only six patients. And uh, we're continuing to look into that. So in conclusion, and I wanted to add one more thing because uh, the Epstein-Barr virus is, is endemic in Puerto Rico, and, and I guess in the United States as well. You remember the term Burkitt's lymphoma. It's a lymphoma that was associated with the virus in children in Africa because we have a mixture of African blood with Spanish blood and uh, in the, uh, an Indian blood in Puerto Rico. We have this virus in, in the whole population, and I found that in every patient with lymphoma in Puerto Rico that I've seen, I don't know how many because we're counting them now. It must be, it must be anywhere between 40 to 75 patients. I, I'm not sure yet. But all of them, I have done a titer of Epstein-Barr IgG, viral capsid antigen, and nuclear antigen. So if you have a patient that you suspect chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, hypothyroidism, Every patient with hypothyroidism in Puerto Rico, we started suspecting them of having Epstein-Barr as the cause of the hypothyroidism. Of course, cause of hypothyroidism is a multifaceted uh, topic because it, uh, uh, obesity, pollution will predispose that thyroid, but eventually we have these patients with many nodules and the nodules are biopsied. What's the most common result of a negative biopsy? Chronic lymphocytic infiltrate. It's all normal, but it's a chronic lymphocytic infiltrate consistent with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But why do they have the Hashimoto's thyroiditis and why the chronic lymphocytic infiltrate? So we started thinking Epstein-Barr and all these patients had the titers up the roof. We haven't done the antigen because it's much more expensive and some patients insurance doesn't cover it, but the ones that we've done the IgG, they, they've all come out positive. All the papillary carcinoma patients and follicular carcinoma also have come out positive with an Epstein-Barr virus titer. So now we're managing hypothyroidism, not only with the usual detoxification or weight reduction uh, strategies, but also as, an anti uh, as a viral disease. And the chronic fatigue syndrome, of course, and fibromyalgia that are positive to the titer, and we've seen uh, excellent results. And of course, one of the main papers on Epstein-Barr virus and the and the, uh, the results of lowering antibody uh, load in the body and also lowering the symptoms is uh, Dr. Honingate's paper here from Riordan Clinic. Uh, I think that was about two or three years ago. And that paper shows that vitamin C is effective against Epstein-Barr. So we use the same strategies with these patients. And they, they've been very effective as well. And to summarize, intravenous vitamin C and hydrogen peroxide infusions are associated with a signif uh, statistically significant and lasting reduction of pain in patients with chikungunya. DVI, which is direct venous introduction of ozone, is associated with a disappearance of pain in patients with chikungunya. We need to study this further. Minor side effects were reported, and most can be avoided by eating before and during infusions. And we have the Zika virus in Puerto Rico. Uh, how do I put it? I think that's the, the, the you can only laugh at these things. I, I think that's a big joke. First of all, I, I've been hearing the news about this major epidemic in Puerto Rico, but I haven't seen the epidemic, number one. Number two, we have seen some cases of Zika in the last month. Yes, I have to say that we have seen them. 
And it's a characteristic conjunctivitis, malaise, little sore throat, but it, they usually uh, go away by, without any vitamin C. The, the, it's a very weak virus, if it's a virus. It's very weak uh, and it's very uh, short-lasting. But we started uh, trying to develop a strategy to, we, we don't believe at all that this is causing the microcephaly in children, I'll tell you why. If you go to the CDC website, and I love giving the CDC website because they, they themselves have the data. The CDC has been reported on microcephaly for 30 or 40 years. In the United States, there are about 12 to 15,000 cases of microcephaly a year. But who's raised the alarm? Nobody's complaining about it. No. That incidence has not changed with Zika. It's still there. The CDC mentions as one of the main causes of microcephaly in the United States, guess what? Pesticides. In the website. Go today. It's right there. So they mention that. Pesticides. But of course, they don't say it's a cause. They say it could be a contributor. You know how the language is. So we have to be very careful about calling something due to a virus when in reality it may be due to pesticides or it, or it may be due to both. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be careful. We should be careful because we know German measles and measles can be associated to microcephaly and other uh, congenital malformations, so we have to be careful. So I, I recommend vitamin C for pregnant females. Some of my colleagues say, well, that's gonna be, uh, that's gonna damage the, the fetus. And I said, no, it's not. And we have someone, and I thanks, uh, thank to Thomas Levy, he gave me this reference from Klenner in, in the Journal of Applied Nutrition. He treated 300 pregnant females. All of them, he gave vitamin C by mouth. Four grams uh, the first trimester, six grams the second trimester, and 10 grams the third trimester of pregnancy a day. The labor was shorter in the ones that got the vitamin C, less painful in the ones that got it versus the ones that did not take it daily. Stria gravidare was totally absent in the females that will take vitamin C that would exercise after the pregnancy. And there were no miscarriages or feeding problems. And the children, the day of their birth, were started at 50 milligrams a day, newborns. At the time, these uh, group of babies, he had uh, the only quadruplets that survived. They were the only surviving quadruplets in the southern USA. The first group was from Klenner's group. So Klenner showed that this was safe. Effective, who knows, because we don't, we were he was not treating viral illnesses specifically. But this is the protocol that I tell my patients with pregnancy to take, not only for the possibility of Zika inducing malformations, which I don't believe in at all because I, that data does not support it, but there are other viruses we have to be concerned about. So I recommend that to the, and other situations that can improve the quality of that uh, delivery. So I recommend this to the pregnant females and it has been shown to be safe. And I recommend you read the paper because it's quite uh, informative. So that's the suggested protocol for the, the pregnant females. I saw, I've seen four patients so far, one that was confirmed by laboratory from the CDC, and all have responded within 24 hours to vitamin C oral intravenous. But I have no idea if it was vitamin C oral or intravenous or just the natural course of the disease because it, it was a very mild virus. I have to be honest with you. So I'm not taking any credit whatsoever. We have to study this further. But it's a very gentle virus compared to the others. Not, not so chikungunya. Thank you.